Oh, I know nothing about this. Quantum dots for TVs. Attoseconds measuring things quicker than anything else in the universe. mRNA vaccines. What do the Nobel Prize laureates have in common? Their age, their country of origin, their attitudes. I think the most important thing they have in common is the views expressed in this podcast are my own thoughts and opinions. They do not reflect the values of my employers. Welcome back to another episode of the Crossover Connections with Jack Wayne podcast. My name is Jack. I'm a college professor, scientist, YouTuber, and podcaster. And on this podcast, we talk about science technology and productivity and how all of this informs the jobs of the future. Today's episode is all about the 2023 Nobel Prizes, which as of this moment are being announced and rolled out one by one. I'm not suited to talk about many, if any, of these Nobel Prizes. So I'm not going to comment on, for example, the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prizes in Literature, but certainly all of these scientific Nobel Prizes have something that we can learn no matter what stage of our careers, whether they be in science or other fields we're currently in at the moment. And the the hardest part about Nobel Prizes is it's difficult to see how a Nobel Prize discovery might relate to your everyday life. And so I'm going to try and break down the Nobel Prizes, relay what I know about these discoveries to people who are out there in the community, not really sure what us scientists are up to and what we're doing with these tax dollars that's funding all of our work. The first Nobel Prize is the one for chemistry, which involved discovering quantum dots. And if you haven't heard of quantum dots before, you can see this very colorful image if you're watching the video version of this podcast of all of these different quantum dots that are being engineered and are a prime example of nanotechnology, technology where it's invisible to the naked eye and it's on a scale of nanometers and is really microscopic things and little machines that are doing very incredible work at the sub molecular level in many cases. If you didn't know anything about quantum dots, the one takeaway I had when I read through all of this material, the size of the dot dictates the color it will emit and you could make it a bigger quantum dot and that will change its color and this flexibility in which you can adjust the property of the dot in both its size as well as the wavelength of light that it will emit that is tremendously flexible and tremendously powerful as a technology. It has lots of different applications. The one that may hit you the quickest will be the size and quality of the TV in your home. And the technology in TVs has progressed from plasma televisions to LED, LCD televisions, and now to OLED televisions. If you're lucky enough to have an OLED TV, individual diodes, that have amazing contrast where you can see the blacks are true blacks. That little diode can turn itself off. The downside of OLED is that it's actually very expensive to produce. There are a lot of failed panels with respect to OLEDs. The yield for OLEDs is not 100%. So every time a single clean OLED panel for a huge TV is made, there are a lot of others that fail. So it's actually not very good for the environment. And also that makes the TVs that do make it into the shops quite a bit more expensive for you to buy. And the promise of these quantum dots, if especially if we can manipulate the color of each dot so precisely, it will bring the cost of all of these TVs down and it'll also bring the size of the TV in terms of how thick the TV panel actually is. It will also bring that down as well. There is an article here from CNET. This top secret prototype display will blow your mind. Nanosys, a company whose quantum dot technology is in millions of TVs and it's on the precipice of replacing LCD and OLED TVs, maybe in your phones as well. And not only will we see a difference in the image quality, this will bring the cost of the average TV down even more. It will make those TVs lighter and thinner. The weight of these TVs is really unsafe. A lot of my doctor friends have people report to emergency rooms trying to install a TV by themselves as a single operator at home. So please don't do that. Hopefully this is an even more efficient technology so that the TV prices come down and there's less waste. All of this is very, very useful from a commercial perspective. Quantum dots are not just limited in the application to TV screens. They also have many biomolecular and medical applications. We have a big problem as it relates to detecting tiny molecules. Most of the time, the technology currently allows us to attach fluorescent particles to proteins, to enzymes, to DNA, and we can track these fluorescent particles as they move through different biological systems, whether it be cells, bodies or organs. Quantum dot technology, first of all, is smaller, quite a bit smaller than these fluorescent tags that we add on to these molecules. And the color is also a lot easier to manipulate because the size of the quantum dot dictates its color. It's a lot easier to prepare them. They're more consistent 
consistent within their uni uniformity, scalability, reproducibility. It also could include tracking certain things that are flowing through your blood. And this is where the future of clinical diagnostics could very much sit to try and figure out where molecules are going in your body. So big congratulations to the 2023 Nobel Prize chemistry laureates. They added color to nanotechnology, the discovery of quantum dots that leads to tangible impacts. That probably is a little bit more relatable to most people than the Nobel Prize for physics. The discovery of the attosecond, revolutionary within the space of physics, but it can be a little bit hard to relate to people's everyday lives. I am not a physicist. This is probably the Nobel Prize I know the least about, but from my understanding, this is the shortest quantum of time known to humankind. There is a diagram that's on the Nobel Prize organization's website, which displays and tries to use a metaphor to highlight how quick an attosecond really is. As many attoseconds fit into one second, the second of a heartbeat, as how many heartbeats fit into the entire age of the universe. So this is a tremendous breakthrough in technology that we're able to measure something that's happening so, so fast. One, over one with 18 zero seconds, so a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. At the beginning, when they first discovered attoseconds, they were measuring electron events that were happening over the span of hundreds of attoseconds. And now I believe the measurements are closer to 50 attoseconds. So this really shows how sensitive the technology is that the physicists have developed and pioneered and now won Nobel Prizes for. How does this relate to our eventual everyday lives? There's a long history of Nobel Prizes in physics that have had tremendous ripple effects throughout all of society, the ability to measure things that are happening in a very small fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second, an attosecond, that translates into things that are happening at the cellular level. It's not beyond the realm of imagination that one day your doctor, your GP will be able to do a test using a machine that's measuring subatomic events at the attosecond level that is somehow either a predictor of disease or a very clear diagnosis of a disease. So that is one potential future application. But one way to predict the future, as I said before on the podcast, is to look into the past. This article on the ABC, what has a Nobel Prize of Physics ever done for me? The article runs through a number of key landmark breakthroughs that stem from a Nobel Prize in Physics, which again, in the moment, wasn't so apparent how valuable it would be. In 2007, the Physics Nobel Prize was awarded jointly to Peter Grunberg and Albert Foote for the discovery of giant magneto resistance. In the 1980s, they were studying very thin layers of magnets and noticed that electricity flowed through the layers differently depending on the direction of the magnetic fields, and they made some very, very transcendent findings within their field at the time. And what they ultimately turned into are very thin portable computers. Instead of relying on hard disks made of a magnetic material, they were able to develop giant magneto resistance, which then led to far more sensitive sensors, which made hard drives of computers much, much smaller. We wouldn't have laptops and smaller computing devices, perhaps the phone you're watching this podcast on right now, without that Nobel Prize from 2007 in physics. Another example of this is literally the discovery of light bulbs, the quote unquote light bulb moment. In 1980, scientists realized LEDs light emitting diodes. They were able to make light more efficiently. And in the 1990s, after 30 years of cumulative work from all of these physicists, they were able to make LEDs in all the three colors necessary to generate a whole array of different colors, red, blue, and green. They received the Physics Nobel Prize in 2014. And to this day, we have all of the LEDs that are powering the lights in your home. They're way, way more efficient. They last longer than the old incandescent light bulbs. And this has been a tremendous boon, certainly for energy efficiency and hopefully climate resilience. So you can hopefully see a recurring theme here. The discoveries made by these Nobel Prize laureates, none of them happened in the year the Nobel Nobel Prize was awarded. They all happened seemingly at least 10, 20, 30 years ago. And it's no different for the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology in 2023. Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman. They are the 2023 Medicine Laureates mRNA vaccines. This will probably be the thing that gives me a tidal wave of YouTube comments. We found mRNA first before we knew about DNA. It was originally thought to be the first molecule that would be the genetic blueprint for all life. And mRNA is quite unstable. It is a temporary messenger vehicle most of the time within our cells. It is designed to carry a message from the DNA to the rest of the cell 
which then uses the mRNA to then translate that message into protein, and the mRNA is chewed up and, and spat out. People who were making vaccines thought surely mRNA is not good as a vehicle to carry an immune message that is designed to teach your body and teach your immune system how to defend against an infection over a long period of time. So the traditional vaccines have essentially been proteins or subunits of proteins that are more stable. They were able to modify mRNA. In this case, instead of the uridine base, they modified it with pseudouridine. That makes the mRNA much more stable as a vehicle and allows it to be that much more effective as a instigator of the immune response in a good vaccine. And certainly many, many different vaccines are coming out now, including vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. It has really impacted billions and billions of people. This is a tremendous breakthrough in our field of medicine. The biggest question that people have, and certainly one of the conspiracy theories that circulated around using mRNA vaccines, mRNA vaccines might embed into your DNA and change your DNA long term. This is something that has been debunked quite a few times. The most definitive source I've been able to find on this is from the National Human Genome Research Institute, the NIH, based in the USA, probably the best funded, the most well-resourced scientific institute with respect to genome research. mRNA vaccines inject the cells with the instructions that then generate the protein to protect against COVID-19 and the protein itself is what actually generates the immune protection. mRNA vaccines are as safe as we can make a vaccine in this day and age and cannot alter your DNA. Even after the base modification that was proposed and verified by these Nobel laureates from 2023, it's still very unstable as a molecule. They will disintegrate over time. You have a ton of mRNA in your cells anyway that you're making very routinely. PSA from the NIH, can mRNA vaccines change your DNA? No, there is no risk of an mRNA vaccine changing your DNA because mRNA fundamentally does not have the ability to alter DNA. Your cells constantly make their own mRNA and the synthetic mRNA in vaccines is just like any other mRNA you have in your body. Now, looking at Nobel Prizes can be very inspiring and we can aspire to be all of these Nobel Prize laureates, but it also can be a bit demotivating because it can make you feel like the work that you're doing is not as valuable or maybe you'll never get to the point of these Nobel Prize laureates. I really want to hopefully send out a positive message for young and mid-career scientists who are on their way up in the scientific community, especially with respect to what these Nobel Prize laureates had to go through to arrive at this current point. What do all of these Nobel Prize laureates have in common? Almost without fail, with without exception, A, very surprised, and B, very humble about the enormity of this accomplishment. Many of us might aspire to win a Nobel Prize, but it's really out of our hands. We don't have any control over who sits on that Nobel Prize committee and whether our work will ever lead to that point. But if you go through and read the interviews of all of these people who've won Nobel Prizes, they will go through and tell you they have been through a lot of ups and downs. All of the discoveries they made that led to the Nobel Prize happened at least 10 years, 20 years ago. It's a long time waiting because the measure of value for any scientific discovery cannot be measured usually in a single year. Normally it's measured over decades. It is the long game you're playing. You're not trying to win a Nobel Prize next year. You're trying to set up a career trajectory that puts you in position to be recognized for your work, whether it be through the Nobel Prize scheme or through other schemes altogether. The other thing that many of these Nobel Prize laureates have in common, the work that they were able to collaborate with others on and the mentorship that they were able to provide and they will now even be able to provide on a bigger scale to up and coming scientists because they are very humble in the realization that their life's work may have led to the Nobel Prize, but the Nobel Prize is an ever going thing, just like scientific discovery. We need to set ourselves up so that the next generation of scientists has just as many opportunities to build on top of the work. Many of these Nobel Prize laureates talked about the people they hope to inspire and the mentors and mentees that they hope to be able to influence once they have won this Nobel Prize. And I really like this quote from the Nobel Prize laureate Anne Le Hulier. Apologies if I butchered your name. This is basic research. I don't know. This was new. It was not expected and not predicted. The understanding took some time. It took several years. So it was very interesting to study and try to understand more. And then later on, many years later, look for applications and explore new things with it. So that talks about the time scale in which innovation matures 
and comes into fruition. Catalan Carrico, she made her discovery together with the co-winner Drew Weissman many, many years ago to little acclaim or fanfare at the time. This Nobel Prize winner was actually demoted four times at her old job and it was very unclear in any moment in time how valuable one discovery may truly be. And of course, they were responsible for making and pioneering the technology behind mRNA vaccines. Actually, they weren't responsible for making the vaccine itself. They were just responsible for making the initial discovery that made all of these subsequent efforts from Moderna, from Pfizer, to make those vaccines from mRNA much, much more stable and readily scalable to be delivered all across the world. And the discovery that made the science behind the vaccines possible happened in 1989. This was over 30 years ago. And Carrigo emphasized the positives behind the setbacks rather than the tragedies and really had to move forward. And indeed, this is how any scientist faces any discovery that they're making. They are not able to revel in the discovery because we don't actually know what any of these discoveries will lead to in the future. All we can control is what's happening in the moment and the fact that our field of work, our research question is testable, is validated, passed through peer review and published. That's all we can work on. And hopefully our discovery lets the next person use that information to make even more transcendent discoveries. And this is the other recurring theme out of the Nobel Prize laureates. They're also quite humble in the way that they're approaching this process of winning the award. Very excited, yes, but in the moment, they are not shouting from the rooftops, I told you so. They are acknowledging the broader field of science, how hard it is to make innovations and make breakthroughs, acknowledging also the impact this work will have on others and the impact others' work has had on them. Another quote I really like from the Chemistry Nobel Prize laureate, Louis Bruce. It's a great honor and as recognition for the field. I have worked very hard, but at the same time, there are many scientists all over the world who have worked very hard on their subjects for their lifetime. So I'm just lucky, I guess, is the right word. The Nobel Prize has chosen to honor this particular area of science at this point in time. 40 years ago that you first produced colloidal nanoparticles, it was the 1980s. So this again highlights the timeline, the long tail of innovation that needs to accumulate and compound for it to hopefully one day be recognized. So you're really building a body of work for a lifetime. You're not trying to make a home run in the moment. To really make these transcendent breakthroughs, you have to collaborate with people. You have to mentor people. You have to be mentored by others. And this really hits him the idea that the soft skills, the communication skills, the collaborative skills, these were crucial for many, if not all, of these Nobel Prize laureates to find success in their work. And that's something that you can take away Way, even if you're not a scientist, even if your area is not in the field of innovation and discovery, to make progress on the highest, most difficult to make level, at the end of the day, those soft skills, those communication skills still are just as important as the most brilliant intellect, the most technical chemical analysis. If that doesn't give you motivation and you think the area that you're working on is very trivial and it will never amount to a Nobel Prize or and never amount to broader recognition, arguably the most quote unquote trivial area of science is recognized every year in something called the Ig Nobel Prizes, which brings me to our recurring segment, Whose Job Is It Anyway?, which talks about different headlines in employability that we can learn from science and technology. The Ig Nobel Prizes is a parallel set of prizes to the Nobel Prizes. I don't believe there is anywhere near as much recognition or prestige, and it's for achievements that first make people laugh, then makes them think. If your discoveries fall into this category and you can think of a way that maybe makes your discovery relatable and laughable to people in the general public and excites them where they're talking about the ingenuity or some unique angle, that has the chance to win an Ig Nobel Prize. A couple of ones that really struck me from the 2023 winners, the prize for chemistry and geology goes to Jan Zalesvitz for explaining why many scientists like to lick rocks. Picking up a rock, licking the surface and putting the rock to their hand, to their eye and the shock, the thrill of minor discovery is still 
more fresh because the little blotches they felt on their tongue allows many old school geologists to be able to identify rocks by licking it and feeling the texture of it against their tongue. Ig Nobel Prize for 2023 for public health. Sun Min Park from South Korea and the USA for inventing what's called the Stanford Toilet, a device that uses a variety of technologies to monitor and analyze what you are pooping out. And this schematic is from their paper, which by the way is in a very prestigious journal, The Nature Biomedical Engineering Journal. It shows you the schematic of this toilet system where you fit this toilet seat over your existing toilet and it can do all sorts of measurements, urine analysis, uroflow cytometry. It can use the Bristol stool form scale to measure your poo in terms of how dehydrated it is, how fluffy or ragged the edges are. If it's big, long, snake-like pieces, the Bristol stool form scale is not the University of Bristol's proudest accomplishments, I would guess, but it is a way for us to talk about poop in a very standardized way. And physicians still use the Bristol stool form scale and it can sense your pressure. And unfortunately, there's the diagram if you're watching the video version of the podcast that shows what's called an anal print scan as well as a fingerprint scan. And for this toilet seat that can measure all sorts of excrement and give you biometric analysis, maybe eventually this will become the new Apple Watch. Who knows? Should you aspire for an Ig Nobel Prize? Will that suffice? Well, I would argue many of these prizes have the ability to cut across the news media and cut across your casual conversations more readily than understanding what an attosecond is or understanding the implications of a quantum dot or mRNA vaccines. And again, your work doesn't have to win an Ig Nobel Prize for you to try to make that connection with people. See if you can communicate something interesting, something quirky about the research you're doing, something that hits the news media. This is a good exercise for you to try. And even if you're not a scientist, what you're doing in any kind of job. If you can find an element of it that is relatable to other people, even if you think is really boring, you need to find a way, whether it's in a job interview, whether it's in your casual conversations, in your Uber or Lyft, you need to find a way of making what you do in your work sound interesting and exciting. And the Ig Nobel Prizes do a really good job of spotlighting science that is very specific, yet has these kind of unintended consequences of making you laugh and then make you think. There is one single individual in the history of all of these prizes who has won both an Ig Nobel and a Nobel Prize. And that honor goes to the scientist, Andre Game, who is a Nobel Prize winning condensed matter physicist. He first won Ig Nobel Prize for studying the magnetic properties that allowed frogs to levitate. That was in the early 2000s. And in 2010, he won the Nobel Prize in physics for extrapolating that kind of discovery, understanding magnetism, and levitation towards the magnetic properties of graphene. So in this case, he was able to use the momentum from recognizing his work through the Ig Nobel Prizes. I don't know if he intentionally designed to work on frogs as a bit of a publicity thing. If so, kudos to him. That's very strategic, very smart. But you have to find a way for your research to cut through, right? So that is a headline grab. There is something headline grabbing in any of the work that any of us does. We just have to find that bit. And then over time, he built that momentum. I'm sure it led to other funding that led to the snowball effect to the point where in 2010, he won the Nobel Prize in physics. The Ig Nobel Prize did translate late into a Nobel Prize, every experiment counts. So that was a run through of the 2023 Nobel Prizes as well as the 2023 Ig Nobel Prizes. Hopefully one thing in here related to something that you're doing your current work and this is the core for all of you early mid-career more senior scientists to keep finding new ways of talking about your work in different contexts and different media. From this point on we should have regular content from here until the rest of the year. I'm Jack, hope to connect with you again in the next episode.